On October 8, 1871, Chicago burned to the ground. The Great Chicago Fire, one of actually two fires that raised the city to literally nothing, is one of America's greatest mysteries. Of course, legend says the fire started when an Irish woman named Catherine O'Leary's cow knocked over a lantern in a barn, but no one really knows for certain, and some historians believe that this may have been a case of pinning a great tragedy on the perceived otherness and uncouthness of Irish immigrants. Either way, over the course of 24 hours, 300 people lost their lives to the fire, and over a third of Chicago ended up homeless. Due to the largely wooden construction of the city, it was no wonder that it was so easily flammable. To make matters worse, much of the city's roads were also made of wood, making the very pathways themselves into mazes of flame. Behold, the last wooden walkway in Chicago, the one that survived the Great Chicago Fire. There was another one that got paved over in 2018, apparently. It's located between North State Parkway and Astor, here in Gold Coast. But Chicago has never been a city that gives up in the face of tragedy, and a great journey to build the second city, better than ever, was born. When the flames died down, Reverend Robert Collier said outside the ruins of his church, we have not lost, first, our geography. Nature called the lakes, the forests, the prairies together in convention long before we were born, and they decided that on this spot, a great city would be built. If there was any silver lining to the situation, much of Chicago's industrial buildings and railroads remained intact, and so the city continued to be financially stable. If you've ever visited Chicago, you may notice the abundance of brick, stone, terracotta, and otherwise fireproof structures. The architects of the new city wanted to ensure that history would not repeat itself. And so, like a phoenix, the second city was born, and to really cement Chicago as a great city, moving into the 20th century, there was one thing left to do. Chicago needed to show not just America, but the world, what sort of grandeur she could produce. The campaign to host the 1893 World's Fair was successful, and so Chicago's great architects began their second massive undertaking building the White City. The World's Columbian Exposition, intended to honor the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's expedition, would not only showcase the representative exhibits from each US state and any world country that chose to participate, but also celebrate the city of Chicago and prove its worth once and for all. Hello again and happy new year. Um, I'm back with Mila, at least for part of the time she really clearly doesn't want to be here. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday season. Although I didn't post in December, I've definitely been busy. For one thing, I would love to announce a little change that I'm making to my channel. In order to celebrate this community that you all have built with me and pay forward my gratitude for you all being here, I've decided to do monthly charity donations using a percentage of my previous month's AdSense revenue. Each month that I post a video, I'll choose a charity that, if possible, is somewhat relevant to the video topics I'm doing that month. So we get to learn some history and a charity gets to benefit from it, and I would very much encourage any of you with the means to join me in donating. To kick this off, I've chosen for this month My Block, My Hood, My City, an organization here in Chicago that works to serve and empower youth of color in Chicago's underserved communities. I chose this organization not only for the wonderful work that they do, but also because they focus largely on providing arts and enrichment programs, as well as internship opportunities. And in memory of the World's Columbian Exposition that sought to showcase the great arts of the city, but completely ignored black and brown communities, and worse, used people of color as exhibits for fairgoers to gawk at, it's only fair that in remembering the exposition's history, we give back to those that were excluded. I've made a $500 donation, and I thank you all for putting up with the mid-roll ads and making that possible. So. Today, I would like to take you guys on an odyssey of the weirdest stuff there was to be seen at the World's Columbian Exposition via tier list. But first, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Skillshare. Even though obviously my entire job is learning, I'm always eager to hone new skills or develop the ones that I have, which is why I love using Skillshare and their huge collection of courses to choose from so I can easily integrate any sort of class that I want into my busy schedule. Skillshare is the world's largest online learning community for creatives, whether it be film, illustration, design, freelance productivity, and more. No matter your interest, there's bound to be something for you on there led by an industry pro. 
Pro. I've been loving taking the wonderful Bernadette Banner's hand sewing classes because hand sewing is really not my forte, but I want so bad to get better. She does such a great job of demonstrating these things visually and it's so helpful and has been especially delightful recently as Chicago gets blasted by heavy snow. Much nicer to be cozy indoors doing some sewing. <laughs> Skillshare has also introduced learning paths, which are hand curated classes meant to be taken in order, building on one another. In all experience levels from beginner to advanced and a variety of categories, you can go from beginner to pro in a matter of hours. Personally, graphic design has never been my passion, and yet I always seem to need to be doing it for various reasons, so I'm planning on taking the graphic design basics, start exploring and expressing learning path with four classes that I'm sure will get my skills where they should be. The new year is of course a wonderful chance to invest in yourself and your knowledge, and the first 500 people to use my link in the description below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Go ahead and head on over so you can kickstart your continued learning journey. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to learning about some of the weirdest stuff at the 1893 World's Fair. So before I start with the big list of weird shit that the 1893 World's Fair had, I just want to give you an idea of what people perceived Chicago to be like going into the fair. We can get a good picture by referencing the various guidebooks to the city that were published ahead of the fair in order to give tourists an image of what to expect and how to navigate the city. One of these books was Chicago by Day and Night, a hastily published 1892 book that gives a hilarious and very skewed perspective. For one thing, it insisted that Chicago is crawling with more crooked people than any other city, which wasn't true then and is not true today. The book warned of bunko steerers and adventuresses, or in today's terms, scammers and gold diggers. <laughs> it was like, look out if you're a man with money, see that sexy vixen over there blinking at you from underneath her silken lashes and beautiful gown? She wants to lure you into her carriage and rob you for all you're worth. And it's like, Man, I think you're really overblowing this threat here. The book writes, Chicago has been called in its time, the wickedest city in the world. And honestly, that idea still persists to present day. If you've ever heard the term Chirac thrown around in places like Fox News, you kind of get the picture. But that perception really, let's be real here, comes from a great load of racism and willful ignorance as to why certain issues in the city exist in the first place. Chicago is no more or less dangerous or wicked than New York City or Los Angeles or Paris or London or whatever other big city you can imagine. A city is a city is a city. There's so much to love and so, so much that does need fixing. And those things only will be fixed through love. Now the world's Fair was built in Jackson Park, down on the coast near Hyde Park, where the Museum of Science and Industry is today. The museum itself is actually one of the last remaining structures from the fair, which was originally the Palace of Fine Arts. The other big one, today home to my alma mater, the Art Institute of Chicago, was originally the World's Congress Auxiliary Building. But the rest of the fair, with all these glorious, beautiful buildings that made up the White City, no longer exist. Sadly, they were actually built to be temporary in the first place. This saved money and made it easier to build the fair quickly and later hopefully take it down, which is not quite what happened. Of course, this also meant that the fair was prone to fire. A large fire broke out during the fair itself and another one destroyed most of the fair after it was over. Even some of the most iconic and successful parts of the fair didn't survive. The very first Ferris wheel, which stood at the end of the famous Midway Plaisance, was moved to Lincoln Park and then to St. Louis for the 1904 World's Fair, then, it was blowed up with dynamite. <laughs> Apparently the axle still exists, buried several feet under a road. Anyway, as for the fair itself, it was comprised of a slew of grand exhibits. A variety of countries around the world had representative buildings constructed to show off the various cultural things that they have to offer, as well as one for each US state at the time. There were also various industry buildings like the arts building, the agriculture building, and of course the electricity building, which celebrated a grand display of thousands of light bulbs illuminating the night with what was then a very new invention, one that many visitors would never have seen before. The fair in many ways was truly magic. You can kind of see it back there, but I've got one of the original prints of the administration building with its arches at the top lit up with the brand new light bulbs. 
the fair had a sinister dark side too. Hi, editing me here. I, it wasn't until this very moment that I realized I completely neglected mentioning H.H. H. Holmes, the world's Colombian exposition serial killer. Thing is, I really wasn't gonna talk about him that much anyway. Um, because he's not like a weird thing people would have seen at the fair. He happened adjacent to the fair. And also, I hope to make more extensive video on that in the future, so I didn't want to like exhaust the subject just yet. So yeah, don't flood my comments being like, why didn't you talk about H.H. H. Holmes? L let's just like not talk about a serial killer for now, right? There's enough dark sides as there is, and I'm gonna get into that right now. Many exhibits were openly racist and made for white visitors to gawk at. A number of Inuit were taken down to Chicago six months ahead of time to live in what was called the Eskimo Village. A harem hall theater gave onlookers an opportunity to watch girls from the Middle East do sexy dances. The Dahomey Village showed, quote, the natives of Dahomey, male and female, giving exhibitions consisting of war songs and dances and showing their methods of fighting. They are a savage looking lot of females, masculine in appearance and not particularly attractive. The men are small and rather effeminate in appearance. In addition to these were the Japanese, Samoan, Chinese, Java, Turkish, and Moorish villages, many of which were indeed funded by the countries themselves, but it's a major issue that the non-white cultures were there for fairgoers to gawk at largely, while many people of color were excluded from entering the fair or controlling their own exhibits. When Chicago's black community asked to have their own collective presence, they were denied, prompting Frederick Douglass to perform a protest speech at the fair itself. Reed Badger writes, the heavy emphasis on ethnicity in the anthropological displays on the main fairgrounds, and especially on the Midway, was designed to demonstrate the primitiveness of non-white cultures so that there would be no confusion about who was and who was not inherently a true civil civilized American. Of course, it doesn't stop there, but I think that gives you a good introductory view at just how grand and strange the fair was. It was a prime location for the weirdest of the weird to occur, and the distinctive late Victorian flavor of entertainment came out in full force. So. Let's take a tour of some of the strangest things that visitors to the fair would have seen and let's rank them. Well, I'll rank them and you guys just need to deal with my opinions. <laughs> ah, one last thing before I get into the tier list. I just wanna give a like honorable mention to the many inventions that debuted for the very first time, whether in the US or internationally at the 1893 World's Fair. Some of these were the Ferris wheel, the dishwasher, moving walkways, Aunt Jemima, Cracker Jack, fluorescent lights, Quaker oats, shredded wheat, the machinery that later made Hershey's chocolate, zippers, spray paint, braille books, carbonated soda, the kinetoscope, and the yellow pencil. <laughs> All right, now let's get into it. I have created a new tier list here with my usual um, interchanged names. This time I'm using some fun Victorian slang as the tier names. So for S tier, we've got some pumpkins, meaning really great. <laughs> Tickety boo for A tier, meaning pretty good. Middling for B tier, I feel like that one's pretty self-explanatory. For C tier, we've got Cod Swallow. And for D tier, we've got Slum Gullion, AKA so bad it causes indigestion. At one of the exhibits, there was a Statue of Liberty made out of salt. This is gonna be a theme that we see quite a lot of today because one thing that the Victorians were really into for whatever reason was things made out of things that they are not. <laughs> Salt Statue of Liberty is pretty great, but I couldn't find a note for how big it was. If it was huge, that's really cool, but if it was like a miniature Statue of Liberty, then that's like not as impressive. I'm gonna put it in uh, middling. Next up, we have the Tower of Light Bulbs. This is also gonna be a theme that I just mentioned, Tower of Thing. Just based on the fact alone that light bulbs were so new and so impressive, I'm gonna try and put myself in the mind of a Victorian fairgoer here. Like imagine you're a farmer from like wherever in the US and you're getting on a train from the middle of nowhere and appearing at the fair and seeing all these cool things that you've never realized were possible, never seen before, maybe even hadn't even heard of until that day. This tower of light bulbs is just really taking that new and grand thing and making it so much flashier than it needed to be. So I'm gonna put that under tickety-boo. We have have the 
1,500 pound chocolate Venus de Milo. In the middle of summer, how did they keep that thing from melting? And also it was 1,500 pounds. So that's pretty impressive. Um, so, and, and you know, it was also encased in this grand pavilion. So I'm gonna put it under tickety boo, cause that's pretty cool. Taking us down to, I'm already gonna say it, this is going in Slumgullion because, oh, there was an exhibit where, well, let me back up here. The fair really, really ran on very strange things being made as souvenirs. On the one hand, there were understandable things. Like for instance, there were these badges. I have an original one here that says Chicago World's Columbian Exposition. Um, so you got these really neat like little gold badges. But on the other hand, you had some very uh, absurd ones. So this one in one of the pavilions, you were able to buy a souvenir bale of cotton directly from the former slaves who grew it. Now, remember, this is only like, what? 30 years after the Civil War? 20 something years? It has not been that long. It's not like the formerly enslaved people were running this pavilion with like their own agency, they were being used as props here. And that really fucking sucks. So the fair is still profiting off of like this deep rooted racism in many aspects. And I just find that disgusting. So uh, yeah, this is going under Slumgullion. I'm gonna bounce around here. I'm not gonna actually go in order. Let's actually go to one of my favorite sections now, the orange cider. So the orange cider, is a very strange aspect of the fair. It's one of the foods that was first debuted here. I just remembered I have a pear cider here. To get into the spirit of this section, I don't have actual orange cider, I have pear cider, and this one's actually good. But you know what wasn't good? Most of the orange ciders sold at the World's Fair. In the 1890s, it was the beginning of the invention of a lot of artificial flavorings. And so there was a chemical company in Chicago that introduced a orange flavoring in the form of an orange cider. To explore this, I met up with my good friend, Marissa Croft, who is one of the founders of the Chicago Historical Costuming Society and just randomly happened to be researching this orange cider at the exact same time as me. Marissa works for the Chicago History Museum an amazing museum. You should definitely check it out anytime you're in Chicago. And so I met up with Marissa at her place in order to uh, investigate this orange cider. So I'm here at a dear friend's house and we are going to make a attempted recreation of the nefarious 1893 World's Fair orange cider. Hi, I'm Marissa um, and I'm really interested in history, especially the history of clothing, but also culinary history. And so hunting down this recipe was a real challenge, but a really fun one. I'm really excited to see <laughs> just how either um, passable or disgusting this thing actually turns out to be. This is from like a pharmacist's guide. <laughs> so basically how to start your own soda fountain and make a lot of money off of uh, making sugary drinks for people. As it turns out, as the fair progressed, um, those cost cutting methods made their product less and less uh, orange or cider. <laughs> one gallon of water, one quart of simple syrup, one ounce of acid solution, half an ounce of essence of orange, and half a teaspoonful of sugar coloring. And then all it says is stir well. So based on those amazing instructions, we're gonna do our best to create something that we can actually drink. <laughs> we are also going to make the evil version, um, which people complained was uh, basically, a, what was it, like a loose water solution of vinegar and molasses? Yep, so the exact words someone used in a newspaper article was vinegar, molasses, and miscellaneous slops. Uh, was miscellaneous what slops. So it was a bunch of New Yorkers went to the World's Fair and they described the orange cider as a soul-destroying concoction. But it was, you know, by the time October and September rolled around at the fair, like this orange cider was so notorious that people were telling jokes about it. And the word had kind of gotten out that you could make your own orange cider with molasses and vinegar for just like pennies on the dollar. We have citric acid, we have uh, <laughs> orange sanding sugar, we have um, admittedly fancier than what they would have used, uh, pure orange extract, um, molasses and vinegar for the evil version. So step one is making the simple syrup. Yep. Which is we'll start on now. Now 
for the mad scientist part. Your first step is to put in half a tablespoon of acid solution. We've scaled this down from the original recipe, which would make about a gallon. Three quarters teaspoon of orange essence. And then your final one is an eighth teaspoon of sugar coloring. Yeah, this definitely reminds me of being a kid and playing with sprinkles. <laughs> right. My sister and I would just dump them into a big pot. For me, it was uh, soap and shampoo in the bath. Oh yeah. What if we wizards? Oh, I smell the orange. I know, it's very strong. It's so strong. Do you want to put a little more in? Oh, it looks so wholesome and healthful. <laughs> Who's scared? I'm not scared. <laughs> okay, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> it tastes startlingly normal. Yeah, it's like a, a lemonade almost. And it actually does taste like orange. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which I think is, a, is, is more than anything a merit to the Cerlatop orange essence. Artificial flavoring was such a new thing in, in 1893. I wonder, I wonder if it's, if it was just a matter of like them being used to like having things that didn't taste like what they were supposed to. It's <laughs> also very true. Yep. Lest we forget the sawdust bread. Yep. Okay, win for this recipe, mm -hmm. which, as far as we can tell, was as close to the original recipe as we can get. Probably the one from the Florida exhibit. Exactly, yeah. The Florida pavilion had the best tasting one. People described it as very palatable, super refreshing. One guy said it was the drink of the gods. Um, <laughs> and everyone insisted that you go to the Florida pavilion to get the best orange cider at the fair. So yeah, um, yeah this, I, I definitely would, I, I'd go, I'd go enjoy this while looking at like some Floridian objects. All right, so now should we try the evil elixir? Yes, so for context, as the fair wore on, uh, more imitators popped up making this orange cider, trying to make a buck off the popularity of the Floridian orange cider. And, uh, you know, things got out to the press. People were like, this orange cider doesn't contain oranges, nor is it cider um, by any legal definition. And uh, most reports said that it was a mixture of molasses and vinegar as the like two ingredients. Some said other things, but you know, those are the two that we're going with because that was the most commonly reported. <laughs> what would you need to make evil orange cider? Um, a quart of water, eighth of a cup of vinegar, and a quarter cup of molasses is what we're starting with for now. For science, we must indulge. Yet. It smells like vegetables. <laughs> Is this the beef tea that they were speaking of? <laughs> okay. Cheers. Cheers. Okay. Not a strong flavor. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> you know what it tastes okay, I know what it tastes like. What? You know the, the, the liquid that comes out of like canned vegetables? <clears throat> oh. That's this. what I'm picking up on. Yeah, I I just got like a sweet tea kind of or unsweetened iced tea. Like really bad tea. Yeah. Well, at, at least it didn't make me want to spit it out. Like I could swallow it. So uh, on a scale from one to 10, how would you rank the first one and then this one? First one is a solid eight for me. I I would drink that on a hot day. Um, I, I would definitely tweak it to make it more sour, but I enjoyed it. This is a probably would not make again for four stars. I think the first one I agree is like an eight. Um, this one though, purely from false advertising, I'd give it a one, but based on the fact that I didn't have to spit it out, I'll give it a three. Very generous. Very generous. Yeah. It's so dramatic. Mm -hmm. In some of these images, which I'll put on screen, you can see multiple orange cider like stands in the same photo right next to each other both of which may have had completely differing recipes. And it was the craze of the fair. After the fair ended, there were tons of companies that sprang up trying to capture that lightning in the bottle of this orange cider that everybody drank and raved about. Um, and their imitations were also not much better than the molasses and vinegar. And they were sold all over the North and West. And for, you know, I'm sure if I had FOMO from not going to the fair, I would have bought one and been like, oh, it's just like I'm at the fair. They didn't have like a, you know, food bloggers back then. When you're at the World's Fair, first thing you're gonna do, you're gonna go down to the Florida Pavilion and you're going to get the orange cider. Oh my God, you guys, it was so good. <laughs> Drink of the gods. <laughs> to learn more about the orange cider itself, Marissa is making an amazing blog post for the Chicago History Museum's website, which will be linked below and you can go read that and learn more about the 
orange cider of the World's Fair. And also, just check out the Chicago History Museum itself, because there's so much amazing info there about Chicago, about the World's Columbian Exposition, for you to discover and uncover and learn a bit more about this, as they say, wicked city of divine sin. We'll have the recipe in that blog post so you can create these yourself. All right, back to the tier list. So the orange cider, this is a hard one because am I ranking it based on the good orange cider or the bad one? Just the fact alone that it caused so much hilarious controversy, I'm putting it under some pumpkins. Speaking of oranges, we have another tower made of random object. We have the Tower of Oranges. I mean, just look at the photos of this thing. It's insane how tall it was. We'll put that under Tickety Boo because they somehow managed to make these same oranges stay fresh enough to be in this tower form the entire fair. That's witchcraft to me. <laughs> the French beef tea. I'll put up on the screen a <laughs> Victorian recipe for beef tea. Um, it's really disgusting, but beef tea was not only advertised as like a healthful drink for those who have like um, digestive problems, it was also advertised as a uh, dietary option for invalids. The beef tea, I just find it disgusting, I'm, but it's not like offensive necessarily, so I'm putting it under Codswallop. The carrier pigeons. So this wasn't exactly an exhibit, it was just like a thing that there was to be seen at the fair. Um, not a whole lot to say about this one, uh, it's just that there were a bunch of carrier pigeons uh, demonstrating their talents flying across the fair carrying messages. I find that adorable. And coincidentally, Marissa has a pet pigeon named Miro, and he is so cute. He was a little camera shy, but um, I managed to get him to trust me enough to eat out of my hand towards the end of my visit. So I'm putting that under some pumpkins because personally, I love pigeons. I feel like they're a really misunderstood animal. I feel really bad for them and they deserve more love. The Big Tree Restaurant. So um, if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, I'll put it up here if I'm wrong. This was in the California exhibit. Um, and basically there was a restaurant inside of the trunk of a giant California. Um, it was either a redwood or a sequoia. Do I think it's great that they cut down a giant centuries year old tree to become like a novelty thing at the fair? No, but at the same time, the novelty aspect is very fun to me. It would make me feel like a little elf and I love that. So I'm gonna put it under um, Tickety Boo. Here's another random one that was just like, a novelty thing that people could see at the fair, Davy Crockett's cabin. His cabin was recreated at the fair for people to hang out in and explore. And that just kind of feels to me like a, uh, you know, immersive experience, which I love. So I'm putting that under Tickety Boo. Another cool random thing that came to the fair and was sailed into the fair, I believe from Norway, was the Viking ship. I'm not an expert in Viking history. Um, if any of you are, you can like look at these photos and sound off. So I'm not aware of how like historically accurate this boat was. Sailing a boat across the world to go to the World's Fair that is a Viking ship is just so cool. And I love this. So this is going under some pumpkins. All right, now we're getting into some things that caused drama at the fair. In the Midway Plaisance, which was technically separate from the fair, um, there was like the main fair itself, which had more like official things. And then the Midway Plaisance, which was kind of the Wild West. That's where you saw like the weirdest stuff and usually the most racist stuff. There was all sorts of interesting things going on. One thing was the captive balloon. It wasn't really a hot air balloon, but it was like tied down. And it was a balloon that you could go up and down in as like a ride. Um, to experience floating in a hot air balloon without actually being in one. Unfortunately, a big storm came in and the balloon crashed. So that was a big tragedy. Um, rest in peace. <laughs> it's a bummer that it died. So I'm putting it in tickety boo because I feel bad for it. But some uh, news drama that happened. There were two separate incidents of men mailing themselves to the fair in a box. That's hilarious and I'm putting it under some pumpkins. Back to strange objects. There was to be seen a, I believe, three ton hunk of cheese from Canada. It was dubbed the monster cheese or the mammoth cheese. I don't think I need to explain myself. That's going under some pumpkins. Following the trend of large objects in the Oregon Pavilion, there were three foot tall fruit preserves. Like the, the jars were three feet tall and apparently the fruit itself was fairly large too. It's not as like mind blowing to me, so I'm putting it under middling. 
Sorry, Oregon. The Hall of Taxidermy. I am not surprised at all that the fair had a Hall of Taxidermy. The Victorians were very into that. It had some really strange things in there, like a woolly mammoth. Personally, I'm really into oddities. So I'm gonna put it under tickety boo. Montana's Silver Lady. So this was a statue of a woman from Montana. Colorado had one too that was made entirely of silver. This makes a lot of sense. This was during the big mining rushes. Colorado and Montana were both known for silver mines. And what better way to display how much silver your state has than to make a statue of a bodacious babe <laughs> for people to oogle at. I love that. So I'm putting it under tickety-boo. Same with the Colorado one. Following the trend of grandeur here, um, Germany had a lot at the fair, actually. They had a, a ton of stuff. And it was very expensive stuff, too. There was a whole section of their exhibition that was showing off German toy making uh, talents. And inside this room was an extravagant stagecoach. I mean, this thing, just look at it. It is mind-blowing how extravagant this coach is. So of course I need to put this under some pumpkins. All right, the ostrich farm. I have actually made a video about ostrich farms, specifically in Los Angeles. It does not surprise me in the slightest that there was one at the World's Fair. Just based on how I know a lot of the ostriches were treated and how poorly they were treated being um, transported from their home, usually in South Africa. Uh, I'm gonna put this one under middling. But speaking of animals, uh, and being treated poorly. There was Hagenbeck's Animal Show, which was basically an animal circus, but really over the top. One visitor to the fair named Bill Hillman wrote in his docu-novel his experience watching the animal show. He wrote, Carl Hagenbeck claims to have domesticated and trained more wild animals than any living man and his menagerie included elephants, lions, tigers, leopards, bears, dogs, pigs, goats, sheep, horses, ponies, zebras, and boars. The whole arena was adorned with countless monkeys and exotic birds such as storks and parrots. The animals were displayed in such a way that it was hard to believe they were in captivity and their interactions provided infinite combinations and forms of entertainment. Prince, the equestrian lion, rode on horseback and leaped over banners with the grace and agility of a circus girl. A second lion rode a chariot, drawn by a pair of Bengal tigers, while another tiger balanced himself on a revolving globe. Polar bears walked a tightrope, and black bears rolled down a toboggan slide. White goats frolicked around the ring in a company with spotted leopards, and a tiny poodle held a hoop for a great black panther. So tame were the beasts that at times the chief keeper regularly took groups of them for an airing past our camp and around the plaisance, despite the protests of Colombian guards and special police. So that gives you kind of an idea of like what sort of situation the animal show was. Much like a circus, the only way he could have, at least in the Victorian era, based on the trends of the day, trained these animals to act in such a way was through animal abuse. And also not only that, but taking them on walks through the midway plaisance just out in the open put a lot of the fairgoers in danger, no matter how well-trained these animals were. So I'm putting that under cod swallop. Another very strange uh, and somewhat dangerous exhibit at the fair was the prison and torture exhibit, which not only showed off medieval forms of torture, which Oh, I have a feeling that a lot of the myths about medieval torture didn't start here, but some of them probably did. This exhibit also showed off different forms of torture and imprisonment from <laughs> savage countries. All in all, just very bad, full of misinformation, and it's going in slumgullion. On a lighter note, there was a very interesting exhibit that was just like an army of windmills. Um, I assume this was from the Netherlands exhibit, but it's just funny to me that they were just like, look at all of our windmills. I love that. So it's going under tickety-boo. I saved the two best for last uh, on purpose. Let's go to one of the most famous aspects of the World's Columbian Exposition, the Ferris wheel. This was not technically speaking the first ever existing Ferris wheel. There were like prototypes before this, but this was the first Ferris wheel as we know it today. It sat at the end of the Midway Plaisance. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore um, unless they dig up that axle in St. Louis. <laughs> it was such a new experience for so many people, moving at such a great height in a big circle that of course it terrified a lot of people the minute they got on the Ferris wheel. And 
it's no wonder that at least one person um, allegedly lost his mind. So this story was actually told to the Chicago Interocean newspaper by a Kentucky couple. It took me so long to track this down. I had to go to the Chicago Public Library and uh, go through the microfilm and scroll and scroll and scroll until I finally found the article that this came from. Please just allow me to regale you with the actual story from this article. Madman in midair, Kentuckian becomes crazed in the Ferris wheel, wanted to kill himself, twice attempted to jump out of the moving car. A cool woman finally quiets him by tying her skirt about his head. A gentleman and his wife, who later gave their names as Mr. and Mrs. A.G. Warrett of Covington, Kentucky, bought tickets for a ride around the wheel. It seems that the gentleman had hesitated about making the trip, as previous experiences in ascending to great heights, always affected him strangely. After the first sickening, fainting sensation, he always became possessed of a desire to throw himself into space. So he knew this was a habit that he had, and yet he still got on the Ferris wheel. Okay. The doctors had told him that many people under the same circumstances were similarly disposed, in fact, that the desire sometimes became uncontrollable. They classed it as a distinct brain disease. <laughs> Mrs. Warrett had on a previous visit to the fair been up in the wheel and she declared to her husband that the floors were so level and the ascension so gradual that it was hard for her to realize that she was going up. She also expatiated upon the loveliness of the scene from the windows and its extent and advised that he try it. So yesterday they both tried it. They obtained seats in the car and placidly moved along until the upper turn was reached when Mr. Warrett complained of feeling ill. He almost fainted, but there was no way of stopping the wheel. The car was half full of people, principally women. The man became crazed with excitement and began to pace excitedly up and down the car, driving the women, whom he had no intention of hurting, before him like scared sheep. He jumped up on the sides of the car repeatedly and was so powerful in his paroxysms that he actually bent the iron bars. The attendant, one goes round with every car, grappled with him, and assisted by two or three other men, attempted to hold him, but their strength proved inadequate, for he threw them off easily and made for the door, which fortunately is always locked. He shook it violently and only succeeded in breaking some of the glass. Mr. Warrett continued unmanageable until the car had almost reached the landing. Then he became calmer and, breaking down completely, laughed and sobbed convulsively. The wheel always makes two revolutions before the occupants of any car are allowed to get out. The attendant thought that as the car went by the landing, he would open the door quickly and shove Mr. Warrett out, but the motion was too rapid and the passengers prepared for another scene and struggle. Some of them said afterward that Mr. Warrett's terror was appalling when he realized he was going up again. He implored that the car be stopped and then begged that they throw him down and hold him. There was some hesitation in doing this as the men in the car had experience of his strength during the first trip. The three men grappled him, however, and strained every nerve before there was any occasion for force while women huddled in a corner and looked at him. The tops of the houses of Midway had hardly been skirted before he began to try to tear himself loose and dash against the bars. The men who were holding him, having exhausted themselves when he was peaceful, did not know what to do. Just at this time, a woman, who would not give her name, came to the rescue. Flinging modesty and propriety to the wind for the nonce, she unbuckled her skirt at the back, she stepped out of it and threw it over the crazy man's head. And she held it there until they were permitted to leave the car at the station. Under this treatment, Mr. Warrett became quiet as an ostrich under similar handling. The lady was allowed to put on her skirt in the car and thus ended what might have been a tragedy. Because I love this story so much, and of course nobody died, I'm putting this under some pumpkins. Now, for our final contestant, After the Ball, which was a song that became very popular during the fair. Um, I'll play a very short clip of it here, not too much because of copyright.
This is a classic case of a song being played so much that people start hating it, but I have never heard of a reaction quite this extreme. There is a really fantastic collective article on this uh, whole situation from World's Fair Chicago 1893.com, which is an amazing website that I got a lot of my research from. Um, so definitely check them out, I've linked them below. After the Ball by Charles K. Harris um, was played throughout the fairground constantly. You can imagine that people who uh, are there for any long period of time would get sick of it. Uh, the Inter-Ocean newspaper, once again one of the best uh, chroniclers of incidents from the fair, wrote on October 7th, 1893, that music had its charms to sue the savage breast men once would say, but that was in the days before, after the ball, and boom da. So poetic. Charles K. Harris, a songwriter from Milwaukee, said that he wrote the song in one hour. <laughs> and eventually sold 2 million copies of sheet music just after its release. The lyrics go, After the ball is over, after the break of morn, after the dancer is leaving, after the stars are gone, many a heart is aching, if you could read them all, many the hopes have vanished after the ball. One journalist named Teresa Dean wrote of her experience with this song on the fairgrounds. Within hearing distance of a band of music from the Orient, a brass band in an Irish village, another one in a tented garden, and still another in the German village, and all of them were at that minute playing after the ball. I spent the afternoon on the midway and in sauntering along was never without the familiar strains of that ballad from some direction. Everybody recognized it and everybody seemed to enjoy it. I overheard a man say that the composer, Charles K. Harris, had made $100,000 out of it. The only rival after the ball had among the Midway bands was Daddy Won't Buy Me a Bow Wow. But I think it goes without saying that that soon people's love of this song turned to uh, mild distaste and then to violence. The journalist continued, Last evening a man was lifted to the shoulders of several men and carried out from the midst of a throng and deposited with a sort of dull thud by the roadside. Someone asked what the man had done. A dozen voices shouted, Done? He was whistling after the ball. That settled it. So as you can imagine, it was only a matter of time before things got especially violent. <laughs> Once again, the Chicago Inter-Ocean newspaper reports on an incident on September 27th, 1893. World's Fair Chicago 1893.com writes, a fight broke out on the midway late in the evening of Monday, September 25th. Helen and Ella Blake, accompanied by a Chicago policeman, were patrons of the Mexican theater inside the former captive balloon park. When one of the Blake sisters attempted to sing after the ball, Madge Heath, a dancer in the theater, vociferously objected. A fight broke out when the police officer tried to silence Heath and then knocked her down. Pianist Baron Von Zito got involved. Sergeant Gleason of the Colombian Guard was passing by on the midway when he heard the commotion and entered the fray. When theater manager George F. Morgan grabbed his revolver and fired it into the belligerent crowd, he hit and seriously injured Gleason. All the fighting parties were arraigned the next day in city court. Uh, but at least Miss Blake didn't get to sing the song. <laughs> so where shall we place after the ball? Um, on the one hand, is the anger it invoked in so many people just so funny? Yes. However, if I was a fair goer, I also probably would have been personally driven to madness by the song as well. I'll put this one under Cod Swallop. So here we have it, our final tier list. Um, looks like most things ended up in Tickety Boo, so that's a pretty good streak. But we did have some real, uh, real uh, stinkers here. As with anything in the Victorian era, there's a lot of good and an equal amount of bad usually. One interesting thing that I read in my research, um, which I will put on screen here, is the security department's final report of various crimes at the World's Columbian Exposition, which is really hard to find, but thankfully was published in the World's Columbian Exposition, the Chicago World's Fair of 1893 by Norm Bulletin and Christine Lang, gives us a good idea of what sort of crimes we were dealing with at the World's Columbian Exposition. So these final numbers from the security department are 421 people taken into custody for petty pilfering, 954 arrests, 438 convictions, 94 acquittals, 
uh, one escape, <laughs> 30 children lost, but only 20 restored to their parents, 539 shadowy or suspicious persons, 408 reports of people getting over the fence into the fair, one report of Zulu acting improperly, whatever that means, three reports of finding a fetus on the grounds, five reports of employees killed, 135 reports of ex-convicts on the grounds, two reports of patrol wagons colliding with an ambulance, 33 reports of attempts to gain admission on fraudulent passes, 30 reports of Kodak cameras without permits, 37 reports of taking photographs without a permit, and finally 10 reports of attempts to pass counterfeit money. Reflecting back on the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, did it succeed what it set out to do? Did it really make Chicago recognized as the Paris of America? It's really hard to say. Um, I think it did cement Chicago as a significant city in America for sure. There is so much in this city to love, so many beautiful things. And I think the World's Columbian Exposition is a really magnificent piece of that history and also a really dark one in many ways. But what could possibly be more Chicago than that, right? Of course, there was another World's Fair later in the 1930s, the Century of Progress Fair, which was certainly a lot more uh, tech savvy, tech forward, a lot more art deco. I won't be getting into that today, obviously, but maybe someday in the future we'll uh, tackle the Century of Progress and see what strange things they had there. Let me know if you really enjoyed this, if there's any other World's Fairs that you'd like me to do this with. I had so much fun hopping around the city and exploring it. I even discovered a distillery here in Chicago that has World's Fair inspired imagery on their packaging. So you have the uh, statue here, which I really wish that statue still existed. Visiting the former Palace of Fine Arts was an incredible experience um, when I went down there with my friends, seeing just how magnificent and grand and huge the building was. And then looking at it on the map, and seeing how small it was compared to some of the other buildings like the Liberal Arts Building. I can't fathom an event of equal stature happening today. I can't fathom an event that would attract people from all over the world, from all over the United States, coming to one city to experience so much hope for the future. I don't know that we'll ever get to that point again, but it really is wonderful to try and put ourselves in the minds of people back then over a hundred years ago and try just a little bit to imagine what they must have felt getting off the train right at the fair and being confronted with this magnificent image of what the future could be. That sort of hope that people had is inspiring in and of itself. And I think there's a lot that we today could take from that. So I'll be back in a couple weeks with a new video, but until next time, wash thy hands, wear thy mask, and don't drink any nefarious orange cider from strange vendors. Mm -hmm.